Thank you, David. Thank you, Rita, for that worship. That was awesome. It just helps to bring that presence down. That's what we all need and want. What we're going to do is, I said, how do you want to do all this? He said, I want to give out the, the mantles and uh, his presence and the seven spirits of God moving. And he says, then you're going to shift over into, uh, we're going to have a uh, time of prayer for healing or emotions or whatever the need is. So we're going to do that. As you know, they were in uh, at Tim Sheets Church yesterday, you know, Friday night, and they were praying. So we're carrying along with that. And uh, I think it's uh, very beneficial for us uh, individually and corporately. But he said, I wanted to wait until we do the activations and then we're going to move into that. Then after that, we're going to go into our teaching. Hey, Amber, good to see you, my love. Uh, good to see you, Susan. Yeah, good to Janice. So, Father, right now, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that you're our Heavenly Father and that you want to give your children, your brides, your brides, the gifts to get us ready. You're preparing us, each one of us, for us to fulfill the destiny that you've written on our lives individually and corporately. And when I say corporately, I mean as a remnant of the remnant. We all play a part of that. So, Father, I thank you that you are really giving out a lot of new mantles during this time now. There's been doors that have been shut and new doors are opening. I know pr prophetically I've gotten many words that says you have new beginnings and it says beginnings. In other words, that door is shut, and now we're into a, a brand new beginning. And I've heard so many people that have called me and talked to me, and they say, I don't understand what's going on. And Holy Spirit says, they're starting a new beginning. And so it is with you. Many of you, if not all, are in a place of a new beginning. For those new beginnings, he doesn't just shove you into it. He's going to give you the mantles, the anointings to walk in it and to move in it and to grow in it. And as you grow, the mantles grow. And so, Lord, today we're here to receive the mantles that you're giving us today. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the mantles that you are giving us today. We relinquish those old mantles that don't work anymore. And we receive the new ones. And we thank you, Lord. These are not the mantles that we bust our buttons on our shirt to brag about. But these are the mantles that we will move and really we will imitate Jesus. We'll be like Jesus. These are some of the mantles that he had and still has. So we thank you, Father, now in the name of Jesus. Father, some of us are tired. We're weary. Some of us are fighting intense battles. And there's times when we've been hit with things that actually knock the breath out of us. Well, I thank you for your breath that you're blowing in us now. Lord, I prophesy to the four winds of God. And I say, come, blow on us. There are areas of our life in the north wind that we need your glory. We need your presence. So blow on us. 
east wind brings God's judgment. There have been things said and done to us that were unjust. And so, Father, we're calling for your east wind to blow on those circumstances. And with the west wind to come and to blow on us, which brings restoration. It brings a healing to what the east wind brings in. The east wind brings in God's judgment, and the west wind comes in to heal and restore. Where there has been chaos, injustice, hurt, wounds, and then the south wind. That is the winds of God's uh, unhindered power, if you will. Many of the whirlwinds come out of the south. Some of us have been hit by some whirlwinds. And so, Father, I thank you that your, the, the south wind is also a warm healing wind. So, south wind, blow on us as well. Bring your warmth in there. When you blow on us, Lord, you blew life into Adam, so blow life into us. Many of us need healing. We need new life. We need new strengths, new hopes, new encouragement. So breathe it in, folks. When he breathes on you, blows on you, the wind blows, breathe it in. Receive what he's given you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody hear the wind of prosperity is blowing on you. And what that means is where there's been lack in your life, that lack is going to be removed by the wind of prosperity. He's blowing on you. The wind of prosperity is blowing on you. We seal it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we're in a time of great shaking, and I think that the shaking is going to get even more intense as we go into our calendar, our year. And so, Father, prepare us now. Give us strong legs and feet that we can, so we can withstand the shaking. But shake everything off and out of us that needs to be out and off. And establish us on your platform. Shake everything that could be shaken in this government of ours, in our culture, and all the seven mountains. Shake it, but let us remain standing. I was given a word back in July that said I was going to be alone and stand alone. But I was going to stand. And you better believe there's not one day that doesn't go by that I take that word and I... I hold on to that word and I decree on that word. That's why your prophetic words are so important. The breath and the heart of the Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, that he's speaking into you, that we will remain standing where everyone else is being shaken and maybe falling, we are gonna stand. Father, we thank you for the oil. And as you've revealed to us, we're really the lamps. And we need that oil. We want to be oil gatherers. So, Father, give us more oil. Give us more oil. Your anointing oil. So that we can reflect. The Lord said it's dark. And he says it's going to get darker. But he said it's going to make your light more intense and brighter. And so, Father, I thank you for the oil gatherers that are here today and for the lamps that they are and that they are reflecting who you are to a very dark culture and a world. And that they shine and that they will shine brightly. They will shine your reflection from heaven. And we seal it in Jesus' name. Father, we, we submit to the fire to come down from heaven to burn out all the junk, even the stuff that we have protected. And we're going to be talking about that today. 
that's where we're going today. It's not going to be an easy day. Father, it's going to help us to realize things about ourselves and other people that we've kind of turned our head to, but no longer can we turn our head to the fire that you're sending down. Your fire burns indiscriminately. It goes. So we surrender to you to burn those areas that we've protected. Today is a fire day, folks. Today is a fire day. That's what he says. Today is a fire day. Let it burn, God. Now, Father, we want fresh fire from heaven. When that fire comes down and starts burning, all that sin, I won't call it for what it is, sin, let us reach out and cry out for your fresh fire to bring warmth into us, to bring zeal into us, that we will run to you like that song said, that we will you're running for us will let us run to you as well so give us the fresh fire from heaven now this is where the spirit of counsel and might come in start moving now and as we start ministering to each other and to those that need prayer for healing father let the spirit of counsel and might be the, the, the spirits, if you will, that are going to do the healing and the anointing and even give us the spirit of counsel tells us what's wrong, what needs to happen. So that means that prophetically, some of you are going to be giving words to people and revealing some of the strategies of the enemy where the enemy has robbed people of their health, robbed people of their spiritual freedom and destiny rob people of their emotions that have kept them bound let's start now the lord said to make room for him so you've got the you've got the floor jesus your blood gives us the authority so it's going to move today healing signs wonders and miracles restoring the dead Now, Father, as we said, there are some doors that have been shut, but we've got precious keys here today. They're opening those new doors that you are presenting to them. That's why the old door doesn't work. You got a new door and you're not sure about it. It's called the new beginning, the new chapter. But you're the key that opens it, and it's for you. Let us surrender to you cause, so you can put us in there turn us may be uncomfortable may not uh, be convenient and it may cost you some relationships sometimes that's almost a guarantee but he says they won't go where I'm taking you so they have to re remain behind they choose to remain behind they choose you don't they do don't feel guilty about that do not feel guilty about that. They choose to remain behind. You've got to move forward in what God's calling you to do. And so, Father, we thank you for the keys that are here. Lord, we seal all this by the blood of Jesus. This is not for our kingdom, but it's for your kingdom that we're doing this. You get all the glory and all the praise. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Has anyone got anything to share that you, uh, any manifestations? This is going to help us with him praying for the healing of folks. If anybody received anything, let, let let's share it. Ernie. During the mantles. It's on. During the mantles, I felt 
tightness around my head. It was, it was tighter in the back of my head than the rest of, but I, I could feel, it's almost like having a headband on. Yeah, that's right. It's the way you're thinking is changing. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That's good. Anybody else? down while we pray for healing we're going to do that and then we'll go into the proverbs yeah but while we've got this atmosphere he said while we had this atmosphere we want to pray about the healing and then we'll flip we'll switch anyone else got anything to share any manifestations all right here's where we're going if you have a need, whether it's uh, other way, you continue to reveal your secrets to us. You continue to reveal the secrets of the enemy to us as well. Lord, we ask that you will cover us with your blood and protect us as we move into what you've called us to do and to be. Lord, we fully need those seven spirits of God, wisdom, understanding, revelation, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord. We fully need all of these because you used those, you, they covered you and you walked in those. Well, we, we need to walk in those as well. Part of what we're learning is to bring us to a place where they can come and rest on us and move in and through us. This is part of the purification, the sanctification, the consecration process that you have planned for us from the very beginning. Help us to understand this and help us to submit to what you're saying and doing. Give us the love of Jesus, the humility and the meekness of Jesus to move in it and to minister to other people. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise for everything that's accomplished in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. For it's for your kingdom that we are moving in and your kingdom alone. We surrender every empire or kingdom that we've ever thought about or that was ever thrown before us by the enemy. We count it as ashes. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to talk about narcissism. Now, you, hey, Dwayne, thank you for coming. You know, we went through about six or seven weeks of Jezebel, and we learned a lot. There's a lot of people that, have, that are out there watching and learning about Jezebel. Jezebel is one of those spirits that's out there thriving in churches. Absolutely thriving. Because it feels so good to people. They enjoy it. They don't count it as sin. And as you know, in, the, in Revelation, the, I think it's Thyatira says, there's one thing I have against you, and that is because that you have tolerated Jezebel. Well, needless to say, we don't tolerate it. 
Well, now we're going to learn about narcissism. And that's another one that's very prevalent in churches and in that culture, if you will. This one is ugly. It is just downright ugly. But I, and I hate to say this, but it's protected in churches. And it's another one of those that feels good. I can almost guarantee you that you have been exposed to it at some level. Maybe in your family, maybe in your job, and maybe in your church. As you know, what's been stated to you from the past and then has been, Susan brought that word, God told me that you're all Elijah's. And to equip you so that when you start moving in whatever God's called you to do, that you will be equipped not only to address the issue, but to win and to thrive and to establish a kingdom of God. All of this is to prepare you for your ministry. I was talking to Kim last night. She called me, and she had something happen. And so we were, we were talking about it, and she told me, uh, she said, I bought this book. And I said, oh, gosh. I said, that's really what's going on. It's a, it's a particular. I said, I bought a book about, and we haven't went there yet. We're going to, needless to say, but uh, we're not there yet. But I said, when I bought that book about that one spirit so I can learn about it, I said, all, all, all kinds of stuff hit me. And so I said, that's what's happened to you because she's, she's going to study that spirit. And I said, Kim, I'm getting ready to start teaching on uh, narcissism. And she goes, oh, my gosh, Verlinda, you just finished Jezebel, and now you're going to go into this. And I said, yeah, this is a sacred cow. This is a sacred cow in our religious culture here. When we teach on this, I was hoping it was going to be a real quick one. It's not a one deal. Where it may take two or three. I'm not sure. But with this, when we teach this, you're going to start understanding people that you've been around. You're going to understand people in ministry and the dynamics of where they are. And you're going to start understanding what if you've been in those dynamics and you have suffered a, a church split or a church uh, constantly fighting, or you've got some very unhealthy, toxic things going on in a church, you're going to understand why it's there. And you're going to understand the spirit that's driving it. You're also going to understand the people that are moving in our system, what, why they do what they do. The, it's promised that we're going to learn how to deal with this spirit. As I said last week, <clears throat> and other weeks, when, when I research all of these, it, you have to look at yourself. I mean, you got to. If I don't, then why, why bother doing it? If I've got the junk... Why am I going to be up here trying to tell you about the junk if I got it and if I'm protecting it? That's being blunt, but that's the truth. Sin. It's called the junk equals sin. But this has, this has really opened my eyes. I was aware of things, but this has opened my eyes to what's going on out there. Another thing that the Lord has expressed to me is, this is part, if we are going to carry those seven spirits of God, if we are going to move in signs, wonders, miracles, and healing, and raising the dead, we have to be pure. We have to be sanctified. We have to be consecrated. 
This is also a part of that. Does it hurt? Sure it does. If you've got to really look at yourself. Narcissism in the church. This is going to go into a little bit into relationships of people as well. Narcissism in the public sphere can be dramatic and grand, a spectacle to behold, and even traumatic to the experience. And most of the time it's traumatic. You're going to find out that the narcissist, where, how the narcissist thinks and how they treat people. When we experience narcissism personally and relationally, the toxic effects are painful and crazy-making. Are we recording this? Thank you. The toxic effects are painful and crazy-making. I was on a phone call with an individual. It's been several months ago. And it got so bad, it was with a, a religious leader, it got so bad to what was being said on their part that I said to myself, I said, this is toxic. This is poisonous, this is poison, and I cannot, I cannot do this. And I had to make a decision, and I made it. Perhaps... Their leadership, perhaps they, he's a leader with charm and sense of authority that appears compelling, but whose leadership style produces a relational debris, that produces relational debris. On the upfront, they look absolutely charming and wonderful and powerful, and they say the right things, they do the right things, but they leave a disaster behind them, the price tag of it. Or is a spouse, we're talking about a relationship that's not in church, it could be a spouse, it could be a boss, it could be your sister, brother, or a spouse whose controlling behavior makes you feel unsafe and crazy. Hear the word controlling? Hear that one? You'll walk, in, you'll walk on eggshells. Holy Spirit, reveal to us right now. Who are we walking around that we're on eggshells? Who are we afraid to say certain things or do certain things around? Because if the egg cracks, they, they explode. And we're dealing with not pretty scrambled eggs. When narcissism invades the space of family, work, or church life, the impact is dramatic and traumatic. There'll be a lot of drama around these people. They thrive on drama. Most of the time they love drama, but it's traumatic. Churches are not immune to this spirit. In this teaching, we will ask how we participate in a narcissistic system. Because whether we like it or not, we are in a narcissistic system. And it's bigger than what you think it is. And hopefully provide clear resources for the traumatized uh, by narcissistic relationships particularly in the church. So this one focuses in a lot on your church atmosphere. You may leave here. We don't, you know, we don't want you to leave here, but if, if God sends you on to another place, then God bless you. We're, we're thrilled that God's moved you on. But if you get in a church and they got a leadership that's a narcissist, you got a very big challenge. You have got a huge challenge. And hopefully this is going to help you to realize who it is and what it is and how to deal with it instead of being roadkill. 
because that's what happens a lot with people with, that have been affected by a narcissist. They become roadkill. They don't even clean up their mess. Narcissism is about control. It's all about control. It is a refusal to live within God-ordained limitations of a, a, a creative existence. Sadly, it is a face that many churchgoers look to for spiritual inspiration and motivation. People are looking to go to church to be motivated and inspired to be close to God and to move into what God's had them to do. And unfortunately, that may not be the motive and the spirits that are operating in that church. Through the study that I did, I found that there's a lot of people that left the ministry and never went back in it because of this. They never go back in the ministry because they've been so wounded by these, this narcissistic spirit. Those with narcissistic personally disorder are disconnected from their core feelings and true selves. This shields them from the shame and pain within. So what I'm saying is, <clears throat> they disconnect from the true feelings that they have, the core feelings, in order to protect themselves. They are going to protect themselves at whatever cost. And if you are the cost, they don't care. It is what it is. We found out with Jezebel that she, when she looked at people, she used people, but they were tools for her. They weren't people, they were tools. That's how they got what they wanted, was because people were a way of them getting their way or doing what they wanted to do. This is so prevalent in the church today, it is not funny. This focuses us, it forces us to take narcissism with a deadly seriousness. Do you honestly think that this is going to be taught in a lot of other churches? No, it's not. Because this is dealing with a lot of sin that's in people's lives. Demons, pure old evil demons. Selfish demons, evil. This, focus us, this forces us to take narcissism with a deadly seriousness and envision a compassionate path forward. In other words, there is a hope. There is a hope. If I was to teach this and tell you there was no hope, I mean, I don't, I want hope. We all want hope. Well, there's a hope. Narcissism is a growing reality that has been misdiagnosed, especially in churches. Now, we all know that there, there are times when there's people that are saying and doing things that are just sinful, and there'll be this other group that will say, oh, but the Word says that you don't touch God's anointed. Well, it's sin. It's pure sin. And that sin will filtrate through that church and destroy that church. It will destroy that church. So it's been di di un it has been misdiagnosed. They might be described as charismatic, gifted, confident, smart, strategic, agile, and compelling. I am better understanding, there's been, it's too, too much now. I, I don't know where I was, doesn't matter. I was sitting, God spoke to me, and he said, Verlinda, he said, many of the people, leaders, are out there 
And he said, they are using me as a vehicle. They're using my name as a vehicle to get and to do what they want to do. They're using the name God to do what they want to do and get what they want. He said they want power. They want authority. They want a reputation. They, they want the glamour. They want the money. They want the recognition. They want the power and control. He said, they're using my name to do it. He said, they don't know me. They don't know me. And I listened to that, and I said, please help me, God, that, uh, that I don't fall in that. I mean, I'm being honest. Well, I'm, you know, this is part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing. So that we don't use him as a vehicle to build our own empires. We have seen in the, in the near past that there have been some great leaders that used his name, but really what they had there was they wanted the power, they wanted the reputation, and they wanted, some of them wanted young women that they could if they could rape. They used them. It was a facade. It was fake. It is what it is. And there's other, there's a lot of instances out there. God is looking for people that are pure, and he's told me this. He's really been drilling down in this for the last month. He says, I'm looking for a pure people pure, that I can trust with those seven spirits of God, that I can trust with the power and the authority to walk in this. He said, Belinda, I can't give it to everybody. I'm looking for pure people that are surrendered to me. That's why you're getting taught this today. This is not a popular subject. And I'm not winning any popularity contest on any level, anywhere, and I know it. It also, it's also not easy to confront narcissism in churches that are seen as successful, special, blessed, spirit-led, and anointed. Wow, those strong words. It's hard to see and confront. We want to see the church as being pure and being the love of Jesus. Most of us want to see Jesus in a church setting. We want that, but it's not there. It's not there. And when we find it's not there, it breaks our heart and we can become hard and bitter and walk away from, from the Lord. We could just walk away. Some people walk away from ministry and never come back. There was a, there was a church in this town that had a minister and he was a sweetheart. He was a really good man, good person. And that church was doing very well. He went they had an elders meeting, and he went to it, of course. And he shared with them he was broken. And he said, I need to share with you that I'm into pornography and I need help. Those elders threw him out of that church, did not offer him any type of counseling, ministry, nothing. Bad boy, we hate you threw him out of that church. Not only did he walk out of the church, he walked out of ministry. He never came back into ministry. That's how dangerous this can be. Ministry teaches and church... Te oh, ministry leaders and churches today are obsessively preoccupied with their reputation 
These are not my words. This is in some research. Ministry leaders and churches today are obsessed. They're preoccupied with their reputation, their influence, their success, their righteousness, their progressiveness, their relevance, their platform, their uh, affirmation, and their power. That's the name of the game for a lot of churches. The people are just, they're just there. They're there for their use. I mean, I'm being honest. And if they have to slide sin underneath the rug, they'll do it. So they won't ruin their reputation. If there's sin in the camp, they don't talk about it, will not address it. They don't want to ruin their reputation. Oh, people might find out and nobody will come and we'll lose our money and our reputation. They have no idea, and this is saying, they have no idea that they are going to face the Lord and they're going to be accountable to that. And they will be accountable for it. Many young ministers and uh, is baptized as spiritual giftness in a way that does a disservice to them and ignores deep wells of shame and fragility lurking deep within. In other words, someone looks like they've got a gift anointing, they probably do, but they promote them up and they're ill-equipped to do it because they've got some issues that need to be addressed. This is not a shame thing. With that young man I told you about, the one from this last week, I kept dealing with shame and guilt with him. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. That was part of the platform that those demons kept him in bondage to them, was shame and guilt. Many of us are operating under shame and guilt. Holy Spirit, right now, let's do it. Holy Spirit, we surrender to you. Show us right now. Is there any area of our life where we have shame and guilt? Deal with it. Ask forgiveness for it. If there's people you need to forgive you, that you need to forgive because they have put that shame and guilt on you, then forgive them, release them, and command and renounce shame and guilt. Tell it to leave your life now in the name of Jesus. Father, we loose as we bind shame and guilt and we command it to leave. In the name of Jesus, we loose the spirit of love and joy and peace to us now in the name of Jesus and hope. Because each person's created in God's image, we cannot reduce people to a label because of one predominant part of their personality. What that means is if there's one part of a person's personality we cannot single in and say that's a narcissist when there may be some other things going on. We can't label a person as a narcissist solely on one thing. Got to be very, very careful. It is describing their true self and a description of a pattern of living and relating. A pattern of living and relating often born, you want to write this down, often born out of life's brokenness and shame. That means that the narcissist was not born a narcissist. I mean that something happened in their life, probably their early life. Something broke them, something brought shame. 
And then they, they develop, with the help of the enemy, to be quite honest with you, a pattern of living and relating with that, with that shame and with that guilt and that brokenness. Dismantling the narcissist's false self is an act of dying. Got it? I got to make a note because God's told me something about that in the future. This is big deal for me. It's an act of dying. We have to die. Dying to illusion, dying to control, and dying to fear, to the spirit of fear. Dying to the illusion is that narcissist has a pretend self that is elevated, that they feel very, very special and very, very proud of. That illusion has to die. That person that they think that is there has to die. Sometimes a narcissist will be a Jekyll and Hyde. They're one way one time and another way another time. We're all susceptible to narcissism behavior, and we are. There's nothing out there that we're not subject to that's exposed to us. We make the decision. Times when we feel superior, we think we're really smart, we think we're really shooting the stars out there. That um, Rita, that uh, Jason Upton, shoot, what is that, dying? Dying Star. Dying star. That's an excellent so song to play with this. We deserve more. Many people think we deserve more. We compare and we complete with each other. And I hate those spirits. I absolutely hate when those spirits start operating in a church or in a prayer meeting or whatever. I hate that spirit of comparing and compete. Don't ever let the devil start making you compare yourself to someone else. The narcissistic personality disorder is something far more serious. It is characterized by grandiosity, entitlement, they think they're entitled, a need for admiration. They are addicted to it. And if they don't get it, they are highly offended. and a lack of empathy. These people will have a very severe lack of empathy towards other people. Well, they were, they were. They think they're nothing, to be quite honest with you. They may be talented, charming, ever-inspiring, but they lack self-awareness and self-evaluation. Self-awareness and self-evaluation. Holy Spirit has a hard time getting across to these people because they don't believe him. Shunning humility for defensive self-protection. They shun humility for defensive self-protection. We had a, a, a new person in our class Thursday morning, and she was an absolute delight. She's being challenged with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And so I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, How do, what do I do, how do I help this person? And so what I did was I, I asked her uh, the same, we're going through the fear of the Lord, and I, I asked her to, you know, to participate with us. And this was very refreshing. I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson from her. Do you know what she talked about? She talked about how much she loved Jesus. Her main focus was how much she loved Jesus. 
and she talked about humility. I'm telling you, I learned off of that. I want to learn more. I said, God, I am absolutely amazed at this, at what you're teaching. And I absorbed that like nobody's business. I said, keep me at that place that I'm in love with Jesus, that I may not be able to remember what I ate for breakfast, and I may not, I may be struggling to get words, and she was struggling to get words. But she loved Jesus, and she talked about him, and you could tell that she knew him so intimately. She was absolutely in love with him. And then she started speaking on humility and put me in my place. It was beautiful. That was, that was God-ordained. That was God-ordained. I hope she comes back. I need what she's got. She's at a place where most people say, oh, poor person. You know, they're, they're struggling to remember what they had for breakfast or how to, anything. Words. She, she had to really work for words. But deep, deep down inside of her, she had the love of Jesus. And she was humbled, needless to say. But she spoke on humbly, a, a humility. She could teach. And she did. She did. She did. God used that to teach us. What'd you say? I said that's heart knowledge. That isn't for mine. Let me get the mic. That's right, Larry. What did he say? He's, I'm giving him the mic, so it's number six. I said that is heart knowledge. What's God put in her heart that isn't in her mind? Thank you. That is a lesson that was so valuable to me. I learned tremendously off of that from her. Put me in my place. Put me in my place. They may be talented, charming, ever inspiring, but they lack self-awareness and self-evaluation, shunning humility for defensive self-protections. She didn't shun humility. She engaged in it. She was a demonstration of humility. She was a demonstration of humility. It seems like the church should be the last place a narcissist would show up, but, but it's there at all levels, all levels. In some systems, it's protected and fosters abuse. And that's the truth. It's protected and it fosters abuse. Hiddenness is the breeding... Yeah, hiddenness is the breeding ground for narcissism, hiding it. That's why some of these leaders that have been doing this for 20 plus years, 30 years, all of a sudden... The light has been, God's brought the light on him, and he's getting ready to bring the light on a whole lot more. If there's anything that anybody's got any secret sins, you better take care of it. Because he's got the flashlight out, and he's going to town. Churches have been a breeding ground for abuse and cover-ups. It's as old as Genesis 3. Here's a case. A married couple, he criticizes her weight, cooking, friendships, and faith. They remained hidden for years in a small group. The group would see him scolding her to the side. He would, it's the wife. He's the narcissist, and she's the wife that's married to him. And so he's very, uh, very condescending, and he's... he's 
he rakes her down all the time, every chance he gets, scold her in the group. On a dime, though, he would become the larger-than-life charismatic charlatan that he was. Church leadership ignored the signs and her request. She got so desperate, she said, I need help living with this. Because, see, she had to live with this 24-7. This wasn't just a Sunday deal for her. And they ignored her because he looked so charismatic that, oh, not surely not him. She's the one that's got the problem because he was telling everybody she's got a mental issue. This is how this can work in a marriage. I know somebody now, I, this brought a light and I understood a, a couple that I know that that's what's going on and how miserable this can be. This is how it works. Here's another case. Now this one, this one's hard too. Uh, Beth is not the woman's name. Beth served as an elder in a large church with her charming ways. She was very charming. Everyone loved to have her around. Oh boy, do we feel good when she walks in the door. She made herself indispensable. In other words, she did everything so that if she wasn't there, the place just fell apart. And many thought the church would fall apart without her genius and savvy. She fostered a narrative that the senior pastor was inept and incapable of growing the church. She starts talking about the pastor. And she starts getting people to believe. Does she need to go out? Okay. Is the door locked? Good. Thank you. So she's telling the, the church that the leadership is not up to par. She's telling the church that he can't lead the church. She's turning against him, and she's turning the people against him, which led to the pastor's resignation. So he resigned. Here's the other side of this. Beth's grand plan began to come into view. She called a married man with whom she had been intimately involved in the past. She'd had an affair with this man that was married. That man had, a, had narcissistic tendencies that his church saw, and he knew that he had to get out of there because the church started addressing those narcissistic tendencies in him he knows he's got to get the heck out of where the church he is so she's opening the door for him to come into her church he was trying to evade accountability he was called to Beth's church she pulled the strings and she got him in there he became the pastor they had a good that pastor never went back into ministry. He left the ministry altogether, the first one. He was a man, a good heart, had a good heart, was a good man, a man of God, but pushed him out of ministry, and he was so broken that uh, he never returned. These two stories illustrate how narcissism plays itself out among ordinary people in ordinary congregations. Beth's congregation were blind to the reality of the situations. There were victims, obviously manipulation, profound pain. Beth's previous pastor did not re-enter ministry. The couple never received ministry. The couple that were married together. These are two disasters. Narcissists are convincing, charming, and tragically, they are deemed credible. This is how a lot of churches split. There's a problem with something, with a pastor or, or, or leadership or whatever. Ernie and I got involved with one of these, 
and the church split, and they took half of the congregation with them. You know what side we were on. We weren't the part. They, they asked us to come back to the church, which we did. But the church, the group that left, they started their own church down the street. You know what happened? They got financially involved with this at a high level. I mean, they put their dollars down on the table and they committed themselves to debt. That pastor, that man, in the middle of the night, he gets a U-Haul and he loads everything up in that building, including the bank account, and he leaves. Adios, amigo. And there they are stuck with a building to pay for, a debt. And he, he completely wiped them out. They didn't see it. This is dangerous stuff, folks. The narcissistic pastor. There is a painful history of the church being tempted to choose power over love. Power over love. When we started Eagle's Nest here, we've always done this at home, but we allow, obviously, we allow people to share and to talk and to share. And I had so many pastors tell me, Verlinda, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't let them do that. You will lose control of the service. And I said, God's told me to do that. Then we come through and he says, I want you to, equip all these people and when God sends them out to their own ministry I want you to bless them and let them go out again they said Verlinda you can't do this you're going to lose people well we know that but this is what we're called to do there are churches out there that I've had some people that go to a, another church, they talk to me and they say, I don't know why I go to that church because all I do is just sit there. Don't, there's nothing. They control, so they choose power over love. They choose control over the cross. They can, let's see, uh, they they concentrate on being a leader over being led by the Holy Spirit. One thing is clear, the temptation of power is greatest when intimacy is a threat. They will start backing off when you bring in intimacy of the Holy Spirit into a service. They don't want that, and they, will, they feel threatened. They lose control. Many, much Christian leadership do not know how to develop healthy, intimate relationships and have opted for power, control instead. Many Christian empire builders, Christian empire builders, have been people unable to give and receive love. I've had some pastors say, because you know we do counseling, they say, I don't counsel. I'm not a counselor, I don't counsel. I don't counsel. I'm not gonna be bothered with that. All right. We've already done this once, but we're going again. All right, here is Ezekiel 34. Then the, Lord, then, the, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. In other words, I don't go to hospitals and visit them. I don't call and pray with them. I don't have none of that. 
Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. You have controlled them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. In other words, that's how some of these people have gotten involved in the astral projection. They got into this stuff. They got into uh, false religions. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord. This is God saying this, folks. This is not Ezekiel. This is God. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field. You can translate beasts of the fields for demons. For lack of a shepherd. Many times these are called pastors. Pastor has become an ugly word in a culture where we love the fivefold ministry and we love apostles and prophets. And I love apostles and prophets. But for a while there, you know, they said pastor and they'd go, ooh. Well, pastors are very important. We all need to be loved, we all need to be comforted. We all need to be ministered to when we're down and out and sick and everybody else is kicking us in the head. We need a pastor. So why am I telling you this? Because I told you some time ago, the Lord said, I need pastors. You are going to be pastors to some degree. You may have a Bible study with some people that are very, very wounded and you are there to minister to them. You may have a prayer group that's very, very wounded, and you're there to minister and to comfort and to strengthen them. You may become a full-blown pastor, I don't know. You may be sitting in at Walmart with a lady that's just about ready to kill herself. She needs a pastor, and there you are. I want to make you very aware that you, you may not be called in the fivefold to be a pastor, but you have a pastoral anointing. You have the love of Jesus in you. You also have the prophetic anointing on your life that you can speak from the heart of the Father into her, into them. You carry that, every one of you. And you're going to be challenged in the future to use it and to move with it. And it will become very easy for you. Because if you've got the love of Jesus, it's going to be natural for you to love them. That's why I'm telling you this. That's why I went to this length to share this with you. Our religious culture in the United States is pastorless. Everybody's out there on their own. And if they make a mistake, everybody gathers around and gossips about them and tears them apart. It's the truth. And it should be the opposite. They should be loved. They should be mentored and discipled and loved on and brought back in so that they can go out and help those other people. I'm telling you what, the church has become accountable for this. And if I'm here telling you, we're accountable because this is a little bitty church. We're not some big mega church that I can reach thousands of people. But he's calling people out. And he's going to make some of these people that should be pastors very accountable. 
and my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, therefore, comma, you shepherds, comma, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the, the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. God says he's against them. This is serious stuff now. This is really serious. If God tells you he's against you, you've got a major problem. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. What does this say? I'm going to take them away from them. And I'm going to take care of them myself. You're going to see ministries falling like dominoes. Absolute dominoes. They were empires. And they're going to fall like dominoes. They're not a safe place for people to be. They are not a safe place for people to be. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. Uh Uh-oh. But I will deliver my flock from their mouth. I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. That is Ezekiel 34 verses 1 through 10. I'm going to go on a little bit here. This is going to give you a little bit of hope. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. It says, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. We know that this is when he scattered the Israel people and he's going to bring them back. But this is so relevant for today. This is so relevant for today. We are going to be counted as shepherds that love and care for our sheep. You may have one sheep, but you've got one sheep that you're accountable for. You may have many sheep, but you're accountable for. Your family may be part of your sheep. You're accountable for. I'm not being hard. It's better you hear it from me than you hear it from God. Many Christian empire builders have been people unable to give and receive love. They don't know how to love people. And you've got to remember that with these people. They don't know how to love. They can't give it and they can't receive it. i got to put a star by that to remind me. The sad abandonment of the humble way of Jesus shows up today in pastors of both large and small churches. Also in beloved Christian celebrities. Now we're going to hit some sacred cows here. Get ready. This barbecue is not going to be fun. Also in beloved Christian celebrities, prolific clergy authors, bloggers, Seemingly godly men and women. Narcissism presents a compelling package. It is the glittering image we present to the world. Holy Spirit, show us where this applies now in the name of Jesus. Narcissism can be interpreted as confidence, strong leadership, clear vision, thick skin. Ministry is a 
magnet for narcissistic personalities. I'll read it again. Ministry is a magnet for a narcissistic personality. Great temptation for spiritual leaders to fall into this. Many testify to fear of failure. Now, when these people are talked to, you know, when, when they share, they testify to fear of failure. They're very afraid. No pastor, when the pastors gather together, they want to say, oh, I've got all these people coming to my church. Nobody wants to say, oh, you know, I've got all these people leaving. Something's wrong. Nobody wants to do that. Profound shame, secret addictions. Power keeps the shame and the fear at bay for a while. It's an addiction. It's a, it's a drug for them. It is just like a drug. The narcissistic armor, the narcissistic armor, this is what enables that thing to stay there, is of self is of self-protection that defends the fragile self within and then offends, oppresses, and alienates others. This is how what this is the product of this. This is what happens. When you've got this big person or this person and they are openly offending you, they oppress you, and they alienate you, they're a very wounded person that's using that power so that makes them feel powerful. They are anxious and insecure shepherds who do not lead the sheep to still waters but they lead them to hurricane winds. Hurricane winds. They cooperate with comparison and competition. Showmanship, here we go. Everybody loves that showmanship. Dress and addictions to substances fitness, social media, social media, and here's the one, approval. They want approval. If they can get approval, that's a drug for them. They will do whatever they can for that approval. Now, here is something that the Lord reminded me this morning before we got started. He said, I need you to warn them about this. And I said, okay. When we were in Cobden in our home, there was an individual that came to church there. And the Lord said, I want you to be aware of that person. I said, okay. He said, that person looks and feels like your friend. But said, they will turn on you for a dime. They will turn on you for the approval of other people or if they can get control of another ministry. And he said, you cannot be in the foxhole with that person. You cannot trust that person. So what I'm telling you is, I'm talking some foxholes here. If there is someone that is extremely dependent on the approval of other people, you cannot be in a foxhole with these people. Because if somebody else comes along and gives them something bigger than what they think you're giving them, they're going to turn on you on a dime. You will be barbecue for them. He told me to give you that warning. I heeded that warning, and I've learned from that warning, and I still remember that. There is pressure to be good. There is pressure to be smart, winsome, inspiring, and confident. Enough. Bring, bringing um, revitalization, starting new churches, 
and bring back those that have left. In other words, there's a lot of pressure on pastors to do this. Pastors, they, the, the people or the leadership think they need to be good, think they need to be smart, need to be winsome, need to be inspiring, confident, uh, bring revitalization to the church, start new churches, bring back those that have been left. When we started to come, when we, we knew we were coming back down here, we visited this church. And in this church, they didn't have very many people, to be honest with you. All they talked about was starting another church. And I thought, what do you mean you want to start another church? You've only got like five or six here. I mean, they really didn't have very many people. But that's what they kept talking about. We want to start another church over here in this town. I thought, you're not even taking care of what you got let alone starting something else. Well, see, here's the deal. They wanted the title of being a bishop. Bishop has many churches. I'm serious. That's what that was all about, was being, being called a bishop. They wanted the title bishop. As you heard, Holy Spirit was not mentioned nor was Jesus. It's clear where their uh, direction is coming from. So in these churches, you're not going to hear much about Jesus. You're not going to hear much about Holy Spirit. You're certainly not going to let him manifest. That's for doggone sure. I have been in a service, and I'll be very honest with you, the, the other person that was involved in this did not, want the, did not want the Holy Spirit to manifest whatsoever and shut me down, shut me down. Did not want Holy Spirit to manifest. How does somebody compete with the Holy Spirit? They didn't want to compete with the Holy Spirit. These narcissists will use you they will hurt you and feel that they're entitled to do that because I am so-and-so. I have a church. I've got this big church and blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling you people, there's no excuse for that. They do not have the right to make you feel that you are below them. That's one of the reasons when, you know, I've been around other leadership and I, one of the things I tell them and every, every person that comes in here to minister, I tell them the same thing. We believe in the five-fold ministry, but we do not engage in titles here. I do not want anyone to feel less than or more than anybody else. Everyone here is very valued by the Lord. Everyone has an anointing and a gifting and a ministry, and we acknowledge and we celebrate that that's it's just no fun where we're going to go next week this is this is this part it's hard this is a really these are really hard lessons the part of the deal is when you get this information and along with the holy spirit you're going to start understanding how some of the churches or ministries that you've been in or are in, how it works and what's been operating. And it's hard. It's a heartbreaker. My heart's been broken by some things with leadership that you think are a certain way, and they're not. I got a prophetic word from this lady that gave us the words on the uh, digging the wells. I've got it dated. I've got it on my phone. And she said, you're going to find out that some people aren't who you thought they were, and it's going to break your heart. And she is right on it. She was right on it. And so it's, it's, it's hard. 
but this is part of him helping you to understand what, what, how it's operating and to guard you, if, it, if I may say that, to help you understand it and help you to move beyond that so that you don't get so brokenhearted that you want to walk away. You know, why should I even be a Christian? Why should I even go to church because that's all fake and everybody's out there for themselves? Because the devil will use that to get you to walk away from your ministry or even from the Lord. We have all met people that have become so hurt by the church that they've walked away. Well, I believe that God is building, if you will, bridge builders here, awakeners. You know, I told you, he told me you were awakeners, bridge builders, to bring those people, those sheep that have been taken advantage of, and to bring them back in. And I'm not saying that they have to come here. I'm not saying that at all. But to bring them into their ministry and into their calling, to give them a hope and to give them a vision, if you will, of who they are in him and to help them to move in it because we need them. We need them. They've seen the, heart, the dark side of it. They're very aware of it. And to be quite honest with you, they're going to be better warriors than the others because they know what that looks like and you do too. And so this is part of your equipping. This is part of your consecration, sanctification, purification process. And that's where we're going, and that's what we're doing. Thank you for granting me mercy on this. We're going to get deeper, and it's going to be real deep. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, addiction can come from narcissism. In my experience in counseling, all addicts are narcissistic. Really? But not all narcissists are addicts. Okay. So my question is, which comes first? I, I think the narcissist comes first. That's what I, that's Verlinda. Yeah. I think because narcissism is a, addiction is a spiritual thing too, but narcissism, there's, it develops a hunger and a need. Uh, it, it's an addiction in, in itself, and I think it just broadens out to, to what, what have I got to do so that I feel good about myself? Okay. That's me personally. Yeah, well, I'm just curious. Yeah, anybody else? Do you think do you think that a narcissist is someone that you know they start off that way you know because they've not been healed from wounds right and, exactly and brokenness right exactly that could be a Jezebel too yeah I mean there's, they they there's, look a whole lot alike the thing is is how do you tell the difference because discernment like, because they're both controlling they're both manipulating they're both you know, it's like, wow. I That's discernment. That's strictly where you're going to have to have the discernment to be able, which one is that, God, or is it both? Oh, God. Is it both? Oh, my. Now, there's one that's worse than this that's coming. Really. There's one that's really worse than this one coming. To add to that, um, Narcissists can be Ahabs, too. Yeah. Yeah, they can. <laughs> when we taught on Ahab, it said Ahabs aren't always those timid, cowardly guys. An Ahab, and I've seen this, I know one right now, that really uses Jezebel to get what he wants. He appears to be kind of timid. He appears relenting to Jezebel, but he's controlling and operating that Jezebel. And I've, I, I know where this is happening right now in the situation. And he's using Jezebel to get what, 
what he wants. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, it's one thing for a Jezebel or an Ahab or a narcissist to be down here, you know, not leadership. But what do you do when they are leadership? That's what we're going to find it's out. It's like, what do you do? It's like, how, you know, we're, they're already up there so high they don't even see that. That's, how do you deal with that come, come, ne come next week. I'm serious. Come next week. I'm hoping that we get into it next week. It, it may be two weeks down, but we're going to learn what we, how to deal with this. I find That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's a good question. That's a good question, but we're going to learn. Because why? this is what I, what, one of the reasons I wanted to educate people on what this looked like, but how do we deal with this and get beyond this? Because I... That's part, Get out of the church. That's, that's part of the answer. But there's, there's other ways, but, but there's times when... Anybody else got anything you want to add? Anything else? These are good questions. Well, Father, right now we ask that we would, not only that we would be, that we would consume the teaching that you've given us, but come and visit us and, and show us how this applies to our life. And then, Holy Spirit, when we are faced with this, Holy Spirit, let discernment key us in on what's going on. And we thank you that you're going to give us the answers for this. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.